Hey everyone! So for this video, I highly recommend that you read the Chapter 3 Ethics Guide first, uh, because what I'm doing for my sort of ethics component of my lectures is rather than talking about the exact same stuff that they're doing, since they're not really introducing a new ethics concept per se or anything like that, what I want to do is I want to give a little bit more context on some of the terms and some of the concepts that they reference without really getting more into because I think a bit of a broader understanding of these terms is really, really important, especially if you're trying to become a business professional working with information systems like this. So I really want to talk about artificial intelligence and I want to talk about data bias. So again, if you haven't actually done this yet, uh, I highly recommend you pause the video, you read through the Chapter 3 Ethics Guide, you get a sense of what's going on in that uh, scenario that they're talking about, and then come back to this video and resume. So yeah, I would pause right here. Excellent, so I assume you have read the guide by now and returned. What I want to talk about is I want to actually talk about what artificial intelligence really is, and I guarantee that it's probably not what you think it is. There's this sort of mystification around artificial intelligence that has permeated our society, starting out in some of the older movies that first really started talking about it. Uh, stuff like Terminator with its uh, Skynet artificial intelligence really made a lot of people fear artificial intelligence without really knowing much about it. But then as we have continued on into the 2000s, the 2010s, and the 2020s, um, we start seeing the presence of artificial intelligence in our life every day, especially machine learning systems. And you might have a lot of machine learning systems that you might not know about in your life. So I really do think it's important that, you know, I try to at least pass along some knowledge of what artificial intelligence is. And then I also want to talk about data bias, because the textbook doesn't really go into the possibility that data might be biased. And when I talk about data bias, this isn't actually data being affected in some of the ways that we talked about earlier in the discussion of this chapter, but rather I'm talking about how data can be biased towards certain results, towards certain people, towards making your system get certain conclusions or actions, whether that is intentional, like what happened in the uh, ethics scenario in chapter three or not. So that's just an overview of what this of what this video is going to be. Without further ado, let's get into it. So the term artificial intelligence, funny enough, is somewhat contentious within artificial intelligence research because we don't really work with artificial intelligence in the same way that we might work with an organic intelligence. When I talk about teaching a machine learning system something, I wouldn't be teaching a machine learning system something in the same way that I would teach all of you, that kind of thing. And the machine learning system wouldn't really be learning in the same way as all of you learn. It's completely different mechanisms, it's completely different things that it's trying to learn things that it's trying to do with that knowledge, all that kind of stuff. So the term intelligence is kind of a holdover from very, very early philosophical discussions that kind of emerged as computing, computing technology grew more and more and more powerful in the 60s and the 70s and stuff, where people wondered if we could have some sort of facsimile of human intelligence contained within a computer. Personally, I don't actually think that's possible but you know, that's my own hypothesis on it. But when we actually started getting into the study of artificial intelligence, it actually becomes something very different than thinking about our own intelligence. Now, there are areas in artificial intelligence that are actually trying to make intelligences that act a lot more like human intelligence. That's more of the uh, general, artificial general intelligence area where they're just trying to make something that's artificially intelligent in all subjects, sort of like how we are, to some extent, intelligent in all areas. Regardless, artificial intelligence. So when we're creating computer programs, most of the time 
we have this idea of what the problem is going to be and how we can solve that problem before we even get started. The problem is kind of this self-contained thing and we can build something that works as a solution. I guess an, an example is if you think about Microsoft Word, the self-contained problem is how do you create and format a document? Um, and the solution is, well, the word processing program that is Microsoft Word. And it sort of has this definite environment that it's working in where it, it has this just, it's not really like working with anything super unexpected. User inputs are not what we would consider something that would be unexpected or really be an unknown inside of the environment that is Microsoft Word because Microsoft Word knows completely how to handle all of your inputs. You press a key and the computer interprets that key data, sends that to Microsoft Word. It can immediately interpret, okay, that key data means I should do this and then put it on the document. And that's that. But artificial intelligence works in these spaces where that's not necessarily guaranteed. So for example, a program that is meant to play chess, a chess playing artificial intelligence can theoretically think about how any possible game of chess might go. It could look at every single board state of chess. It could look at every single possible game and say, okay, these are all the moves that I would make in all of these possible games. But in the end, it's waiting on a decision from some sort of outside agent in order to continue. In this case, it would be a decision on whether or not, you know, I'm going to move my rook here or my pawn here, take this piece, all of that kind of stuff. It's waiting for me to decide that before it can concretely decide its next move and start thinking a little bit further ahead. And that's sort of where artificial intelligence really comes in. One of several definitions of artificial intelligence that are out there is that artificial intelligence is a system that can correctly interpret external data, learn from such data, and use those learnings to achieve specific goals and tasks through flexible adaptation. So what I mean by all this, I'll, I'll come back to the chess bot example. In the original days of trying to make a computer that could play chess, the idea was that you would try to look at possible board states. And in the early days of computers, you didn't have very much memory to hold a whole bunch of information in your computer. So maybe you would look at the current state of the board and then all the possible moves that you could possibly make and the board that that would lead to, and then all the possible moves that your opponent could possibly make, and then lead, and then take a look at all of those resulting board states after one turn that you make and one turn that your opponent makes. Maybe do that a few times, depending on how much memory you have. Look for the resulting end board state, af state after however many moves that the, um, you know, would give you the most amount of value. You would have the most amount of pieces there. You know, maybe you, you still have your queen. You don't want to necessarily put her in danger or sacrifice her unless you really have to yet. And maybe also the board state where you have taken the most number of um, your opponent's pieces. However, artificial intelligence would then get into the question of like, well, we have all of these possible board states out here, but there's a lot of board states that maybe we wouldn't want to take, or maybe that our opponents wouldn't want to take. An, an opponent in chess is going to try to take the move that best benefits them. So unless they're playing some sort of weird strategy, or maybe they're playing suboptimally or something like that, Typically, what you could do is assume they'll try to take the move that is best for them, and then you could discard all the other possible moves and then try to take the best move regarding there. Or you could try to take the move that makes your opponent's move as bad as possible, and then that puts you in the best, in the least bad state as possible. So keeping things in mind like that is what started bringing artificial intelligence into the game of chess. And then people took it even further 
by starting to record the um, the places that your, that your opponent would move, the pieces they would try to take, maybe the different gambits that they were trying to play, the trying to identify the strategies that they really liked, and then over time recognizing, okay, well, maybe the opponent is more likely to do this maneuver with their knight because they've done this maneuver with their knight before, so we can try to anticipate that, get ready for it, you know, really try to make sure that that move isn't going to succeed or we can expose some kind of weakness by anticipating them doing that so that's where chess really started becoming a game for artificial intelligence now when i'm talking about learning here this isn't necessarily machine learning per se machine learning itself we'll talk about what makes machine learning actual machine learning. This is more an artificial intelligence system keeping things in maybe some kind of database, internal database, and then applying some kind of math or program to that database in order to incorporate that knowledge in some way. So it's not learning necessarily in the way we think of as learning. It's more like based a query, the database, run this kind of algorithm based on what's in there and use make that algorithm sort of affect the choices that you're going to make. It's not us as humans, say back to the example of chess, it's not us as humans thinking, my opponent is doing this a lot, so I bet I can bait them into doing that same action and then take advantage of the fact that I was able to anticipate what they were doing. It's more, uh, it's more algorithmic, I should say. So artificial intelligence has a lot of different sub-problems. Uh, reasoning and problem solving is very much sort of what I was talking about with the chess bot. If we're trying to solve this very complex problem where we don't necessarily have all of the information in front of us, we need to reason our way through getting to the best partial solution possible. And then once we have all of the information on hand, then we can try to get to a full uh, solution from there. But reasoning based on the information that you can have and maybe even making guesses about the information that you don't have, like maybe I'm going to guess what opponent, what, what my opponent is going to do and then try to do some reasoning based on that or try to do some reasoning to maybe get them to do that move, all of that kind of stuff. That, that falls under reasoning and problem solving right there. Knowledge representation is a really, really fun one because what you're trying to do is you're trying to figure out how to encode facts about the world and then use reasoning in order to combine those facts in order to create new facts that you can then use to create new information and then new information and then new information and so on and so on and so forth. And you might be representing those as like pieces of data and then using those pieces of data combining them using knowledge uh, representation rules in order to get new pieces of knowledge something that i tried to do before in college using knowledge representation was try to build a artificially intelligent uh, system that would try to solve the game of clue now clue if you're not familiar, is a board game that represent that, that tries to um, emulate solving a murder mystery. Uh, players go to different rooms inside of this mansion where a murder has occurred, and they try to guess, you know, I think it was this person with this weapon in this room. And then they if another character has like information about you know the person or the room or the clue that exonerates them they'll pass that information along to the person who is making the guess and then the person can note on their little notebook that okay well it wasn't in this room or it wasn't this person or something like that and what you would eventually want to do is get enough information about who is innocent about what weapons were not used and about what rooms did not have a murder happen in them so that you know you want you want to essentially clear enough uh, of these variables 
so that you do know exactly who did it, what the weapon was, and what room it took place in. So this actually was something that we tried to apply machine learning to, was that we tried to have all these pieces of knowledge representing each person, each weapon, and each uh, room. And then we would go and, you know, you start off with a whole bunch of clues in your hand that you know, you know, maybe maybe it represents like you were in the room with this person, you saw these objects when the murder actually happened, so you know that all of this stuff is uh, not involved in the murder. So you have all of that, and the machine would then try to say, okay, this was not involved, this was not involved, this was not involved, this was not involved, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then try to do reasoning based on the guesses other people did, the guesses itself, it itself made, uh, tried to figure out like, okay, um, if this person was guessed this, or was uh, asked about this many times, maybe there's no evidence, maybe nobody has any evidence that this person was not the murderer, so maybe we need to put them in sort of the suspect list and that kind of stuff. But like the knowledge in this case was, um, you know, the statement, uh, Professor Plum was the murderer is false, or the statement, it happened in the billiards room is false. Like that kind of knowledge being represented in the machine and then the machine putting together new pieces of knowledge based on logical rules. So that's just one example of a knowledge representation system there. Now, machine learning. Machine learning, we'll talk more about actually on the next slide, but uh, machine learning is probably one of the things that most people think about immediately, where you have some uh, AI that can, I don't know, categorize images. It can look at a kitten and say, this is a kitten, or it can look at a puppy and say, this is a puppy, that kind of stuff. Machine learning is a system that we sort of teach how to do some kind of task, and then we set it about and it'll go about doing that task. And we'll talk, again, we'll talk about it a little bit more on the next slide, but you might start to see some similarities to, similarities to data mining once we get there. Now, natural language processing. This one is a really cool one because this is about how can we try to get machines to recognize human speech? Not actually just the words that we type in, because it's really easy for me to say, type in the word cat into Google and Google to say, oh, well, they're referring to the animal. Um, that part is easy, but natural language processing also gets into stuff like sentence structure. How do you, you interpret a sentence that a human says how do you figure out what they're actually trying to ask you? And a lot of that work kind of goes into digital assistants like Siri or Alexa. They're all about natural language processing because you'll talk to them and you'll say, hey, what's the weather outside? They have to actually figure out what exactly you're saying, both in terms of the actual words and the structure of your sentence. They need to recognize that you're asking a question, that you are requesting information about the weather and not... I don't know, um, asking for the definition of the word weather that you would use in the term weather or not, you know, you're asking for the weather in terms of is it sunny outside, is it raining outside, that kind of stuff. So natural language processing really gets into all of that. Perception uh, will get into things like computer vision, you know, the stuff that, say, a self-driving car uses in order to recognize you know, these are the lines of the road, these are the obstacles that are in front of me, there's a car passing on the left, so I shouldn't uh, turn into the oncoming lane, ideally. Uh, it's still a very imperfect technology at this point, but computer vision, which is a sub-problem itself of perception, is part of that. Uh, another possible perception sub-problem would be with regards to hearing and interpreting words, so that actually gets into the similarities between, or the overlap between that and natural language processing, the perception side of that would be in charge of interpreting what words are said, even interpreting when someone has started speaking to the machine. 
you know, you don't want the, say, Amazon Alexa that's in your room to be responding to all the possible noises. Like if you drop a vase, you don't want the Amazon Alexa to try to start talking to you while you're cleaning up all that broken glass and spilled water and all that kind of stuff, right? You want the Alexa to recognize when you say, hey, Alexa, what's the weather? So perception will get into act, will get into that kind of stuff, like hearing what you're saying, recognizing, okay, well, Alexa is my code word, so they want me to respond to this. And then actually trying to interpret the words that you're saying, and then we'll pass it on to whatever nat natural language processing subsystems it has once it figures out the actual words, and then natural language processing parts will interpret the sentence and the meaning and all that kind of stuff. And then we have social intelligence, uh, which has its own uh, overlap with natural language processing as well, but it will also include stuff like emotion detection. You know, maybe if it sees a picture or a video feed of a person trying to figure out what emotion they're feeling. And if you are really getting into marketing and you want to see if a product is making your consumer happy, emotion detection would probably be a interesting part of that you know maybe you have some kind of kiosk that lets them check out your product and if you see that they're being really frustrated maybe it's like okay well we, we need to send this back and um try to get a revision on it that will make customers less frustrated or something like that uh, it might also be something like sentiment analysis which is reading a sentence and trying to figure out you know is this a happy sentence? Is it referring to something that the author thinks is good or bad or something like that? Um, we You see that a lot in studies based on social media, trying to figure out what people think about a certain thing based on their tweets. You know, you might not just want to look at the words that they're saying, but also the sentiment with which they are saying those words. So that's where sentiment analysis can come in. And all that goes into social intelligence, which is all about understanding the more social aspects of humans. And that's where you get a lot of the creepy invasive stuff coming in as well. All right, so I want to talk a little bit more about machine learning, because this is actually going to be probably one of the more relevant areas to a business information system. It has quite a bit of overlap with data mining, although in the end, they end up being a little bit of different things. But it's very possible that a machine learning system is going to be a part of a information system in general. And I'm not giving you these definitions to necessarily say, hey, I need you to understand what a machine learning system is and how to create one. I just want to more educate you on this is the kind of thing that when you hear machine learning, you can understand this is the kind of thing that it's doing and maybe decide like if someone proposes adding a machine learning system to an information system workflow, you can maybe say, well, I don't think it's necessarily useful here, or I think it might be useful here and here's why. Maybe this is why we should start looking into hiring people to build a machine learning system. Now, machine learning itself is refers to computer algorithms that improve through experience, um, which is a very, very broad term. It overlaps with more the general idea of artificial intelligence itself, but machine learning tends to go really crazy deep into that idea of improving through experience. And typically the way that that's going to happen is either at the point of creation uh, getting a whole bunch of experience that allows it to perform some task really well, or um, as it's performing some kind of task, taking in some kind of feedback, adjusting itself, and then trying to perform that task better. So that is essentially the idea of machine learning. It learns from taking in a huge amount of data and what it's actually doing is uh especially um when it comes to something like neural networks which are one type of machine learning what it's doing is it's creating this sort of um typically it's going to be what's known as a black box which means that nobody really knows what's going on 
inside of it, not even the people who actually create it. What they do is they create this algorithmic structure for a machine learning system to start putting in pieces of data, like putting pieces of data into, and then machine learning system will start looking at a whole bunch of input data and then adjusting this little piece of like algorithmic structure that we give them. It'll start putting numbers in certain places and different numbers in other places and changing how big or how small those numbers are. And then eventually you get this piece of software that which we don't necessarily know how it works because we didn't necessarily program it. All it really does is it takes in some piece of input that is the same type of input we were giving it when it was being created, passes it into this black box machine thing, and then out comes some kind of result. One example is we could make a machine learning system that tries to determine whether a picture that it's looking at is a cat or a dog. We, picture, we feed it a whole bunch of pictures of cats and tell it, hey, this is a cat. We also feed it a whole bunch of pictures of dogs and tell it, hey, this is a dog. And the idea is that it will look at all those pictures and build up some sort of association within itself, some idea of what makes a cat a cat. So this picture is more cat because the ears are a little bit pointier. It's like a little bit sharper, a little bit fluffier, maybe all that kind of stuff. Whereas this is a dog because it, you know, maybe it's larger, it might have droopier ears, it might have its tongue sticking out, it might pick up on all of that kind of thing. So it will um, build some sort, build this association of catness and dogness within itself. And then when you give it a new picture of a mysterious animal, it will take a look at how much catness there is in that picture, how much dogness that picture is, and then give out a result that is pretty much a probability of like, I'm 37% sure that this is a cat, or I'm 95% sure that this is a dog, or something like that. All right, so sort of like with data mining, we have unsupervised and supervised machine learning. Unsupervised machine learning is all about finding patterns from a stream of data, sort of like the cluster analysis type of stuff that we talked about with data mining. But where machine learning ends up working a little bit differently is that we're creating some sort of system that then would be able to sort of reproduce those patterns in creating its own data. An example of this might be some of those art creation bots that you've seen, where you could ask it to, I don't know, paint a starry night in the style of Picasso. And it's trying to take the clusters that it's created that make something Picasso actually like, you know, a Picasso painting. And it's also trying to take the pieces that made starry night, starry night, and then reproduce sort of both of those patterns in one final Piece. So you have a machine learning system. Actually, it's a uh, this would be a particular subsystem would specifically be the part that, you know, you fed it in a whole bunch of art so that it has this idea of what art is. And then you um, ask it to reproduce aspects of art. And that you know, that, that whole part is a subsystem of a larger piece that also includes, say, uh, trying to understand what the user has typed in. So like the natural language, na natural language processing piece would tie into this art creation piece of the system. But what you're doing is you're putting in a whole bunch of information about paintings and then you're asking it to generate its own stuff and that unsupervised nature, nature comes in because you're just feeding stuff in. Supervised machine learning takes a little bit of a turn away from the idea of supervised data mining. Supervised learning actually works from human labeled 
training sets of data. So rather than just putting in random data, you're actually putting in pieces of data that sort of constitute a expect like an input and an expected output. So for example, when I talked about the machine learning system that knows how to uh, determine what a cat or a dog is from pictures of a cat or a dog, you know, this actually counts as supervised learning because what you would do is you would give the machine one picture of a cat and say, this is a cat. The expected result from this picture is cat. And then you take the next piece of the training set, it would be another picture of a cat and the fact that this picture contains a cat. And then the next one would be a picture of a dog and the fact that this picture contains a dog. So you're giving it an example of what an input might look like and you're giving it the result that you're expecting that machine to give you when it sees an input that looks like this. They're kind of like holding up flashcards for someone that you're trying to teach. You give them the question and then you show them the answer that you're expecting from them so that later on you know, you give them a question that has some sort of similar piece of information, or maybe a question that's worded a little bit differently from what they've seen before, but then they would be able to say, well, I'm pretty sure this is the answer based on all the other, all the training flashcards you showed me. That's the idea of supervised machine learning. Now with supervised, uh, these are just a couple of, of types of supervised machine learning. And, you know, there's a lot of different types of supervised and unsupervised machine learning. There's also like semi-supervised and all kinds of other stuff. It's wild. R regardless, um, with supervised machine learning, you can have a classification uh, machine, which classifies an input based on what it has learned. That would be the dog and cat identifier. It is classifying pictures as dog and cat based on what it has learned about what dogs and cats look like. There's also the regression type, which Similar to the regression um, data mining type of thing, it's trying to make an, some sort of equation to map inputs to outputs. But the idea with a machine learning system is that rather than trying to, um, you know, like you, you give it a whole bunch of inputs and the outputs that you're expecting from it, and then it will be like, okay, well, I can expect you know, based on what I've learned of how these inputs match to these outputs, based on the interpretation that I have made within myself of how I can connect these inputs to these outputs, I can expect that given some random input that I've never seen before, I can use this equation to get this kind of output. Now, the textbook is pretty vague about the specifics of that AI recommendation system, one possibility is that, especially since it is taking in data from uh, pharmaceutical companies and using that in order to motivate its uh, recommendations, one possibility is that it is an unsupervised machine learning system. Maybe it started out with some sort of supervised aspects to it at the very beginning in order to associate different symptoms with different compounds that are contained in a medication so that it could look through a list of medications with different compounds, try to make those associations or something like that. Maybe it had some sort of supervised aspect at the very beginning, but at this point, to me, it seems like some sort of unsupervised learning where you provide it an updated profile and it adds, it modifies its base of knowledge in order to continue giving, well, ideally better recommendations. Um, and actually this whole idea of like possibly feeding it bad data in order to boost your own recommendations within the profile does get into the other topic that I want to talk about here. Another example of stuff like unsupervised machine learning would be things like the YouTube recommendation algorithm. So if you watch a video and then you look at the recommended videos next to it and you say, oh, well, this one looks interesting and you click that, you are you are giving information to YouTube, YouTube's recommendation system specifically that said, hey, you happened to follow this one after this amount of time and you didn't follow any of these other 
pieces of recommendation very interesting we're going to take a note of that and possibly use that to improve our own recommendation engine so rather than recommending things based on say similar video content tags which is what they used to do in the past well before youtube even had the ability to host machine learning systems that powerful they used to use tags in order to recommend videos but now it's more like we're going to make these recommendations based on not just the stuff that you click but the stuff that other people also are clicking that we've established maybe have the same amount the same interests as you do thanks to our big data scraping and data analysis to try to figure out if people are interested in this what's going to keep them to get what like get them to keep watching and all that kind of stuff that all ties into this um machine learning system that will learn from what people are how people are responding to the recommendations that are being made and then try to self-improve itself so that it can get you to watch for longer and longer and longer this also ties into the other concept of databases a uh, data bias that we'll be talking about in just a second but that's the general overview of uh artificial intelligence it really isn't like what you see in media at all things like vision in marvel or hal or the terminator or anything like that they briefly graze ideas of artificial intelligence but they really miss the mark in a lot of ways leading to people not understanding what artificial intelligence really is all right, so on to the other topic, uh, data bias. Uh, bias data does not truly reflect what it is meant to measure in some way, which is very problematic. You want your data to be accurate. You want to know that you're getting a an actual um, look at whatever you're trying to measure, whether it's some sort of customer retention measures, whether it's purchasing data, whether it's looking and realizing people's interests or looking at the videos that people like to watch so that you can recommend them more videos or something like that. You want your data to be unbiased. And when your data is biased, what that means is it's going to give you some sort of skewed view that prevents you from really understanding the true scope of what you're trying to measure. Now, an example of data bias is we can think about the categorization machine learning system that I gave. I gave the example of a machine learning system that can take in a picture of a cat and give you, you know, whether or not that cat is a cat or a dog. You know, you give it a picture of a cat, it tells you it's a cat. You give it a picture of a dog, it tells you it's a dog. What if you give it a picture of a ferret? something that is neither a cat nor a dog. It's really can only assume that that picture must be a cat or a dog because you have only ever shown it things that are cats or dogs. Your training set, the data that you use in order to create your machine learning system is biased towards cats and dogs, which means that, you know, because you used this bias training set in order to make a biased machine learning system, you end up with a system that itself is biased towards cats and dogs. You give it a picture of a ferret and it has no idea what to do with it. Well, I shouldn't say that because it knows what to do with that. It knows that it is either a cat or a dog and it should try to classify that. And maybe it will say, you know, the shape of the ears, the fuzziness, the shape of the head. It might have a hard time with it. It might have a low uh, probability that it might have a low certainty that this creature is a cat or a dog, but it will give an answer in terms of how much it thinks it's a cat and how much it thinks it's a dog. So you've created a bias system by only giving it pictures of cats or dogs. You didn't give it a third none option. It gets even more interesting if you give it a picture of a school bus 
because then that's not even an animal, but then it might, say, classify it as a dog because dogs might be more likely to be that color, even if it's not necessarily a color that a dog is going to have, right? So it, you have this example of biased data leading to a biased machine. Response bias refers to the fact that people who actually respond to things like surveys or leave reviews or something like that may not necessarily be representative of their population. For example, if you look at Yelp reviews, uh, people are going to be much, much, much more likely to write reviews if they're upset with a restaurant or a service or whatever. So you might end up with restaurants that have very low ratings on Yelp, which then can affect, you know, how much money they're making because people see, oh, these things are rated low on Yelp, so I should try to avoid them, right? Uh, so that would be an example of response bias not really being accounted for. And this is a pretty big problem when it comes to trying to get information through things like surveys. A lot of people aren't necessarily going to take a survey, especially if, say, you're cold calling them or you're cold emailing them or something like that. If you are registered to vote with a specific party and you get surveys in your email or through the mail or something like that, trying to understand where you stand on the issues, a lot of people aren't going to respond to those surveys, but the people who do respond to the surveys might be people who are really, really, really into, you know, being involved with that political party. So they're trying to actually make um, their opinion known. They're trying to say, you know, this is what I believe in, but they probably also were already um, really into that party to begin with. So their views are probably going to give this skewed picture that, you know, where the political party that was doing the survey already was, uh, maybe they should continue along that path because, well, all their respondents uh, gave that kind of answer, so why shouldn't they stick along with that path? It just is so convenient. And that actually ties into the idea of feedback loops. With the feedback loop, what we're talking about here is how the output of a model, where whether we're talking about a um, more of a characteristic model of some sort, or talking about an actual machine learning system, um, when the output of that model somehow influences the inputs that that model will be getting in the future. And then if we then use those inputs that are affected to change the model, and then this whole cycle repeats over and over and over again, eventually we end up with a very, very biased system. And this uh, political party example that I gave actually would fall into a feedback loop as well. Uh, the only people who respond to this political party's surveys are people who really like what the political party already is doing and don't necessarily want them to change their stance on certain things so then the political party will continue to do that leading to anyone who isn't really into this political party not joining you know new people aren't joining to create change or people who already were there maybe will leave or just continue being ambivalent and not responding to surveys which means that more and more people are going a higher percentage of the population that is responding to future surveys will then be like well hey we like these stances keep doing it and so on and so on and so forth and you get this uh stronger and stronger and stronger incentive for the political party to keep on doing the exact same stuff that it has been doing even if that's not necessarily the sentiment of everyone who votes with that party so and, and you know that's just one mechanism of that of course there's all the other mechanisms by which political parties can you know avoid what their voters actually want, but that's a whole other topic. That's the idea of a feedback loop. Another one would be the Yelp feedback loop, where low ratings means that people are avoiding a um, particular restaurant or service more, which means that 
they're getting the people who do show up are probably expecting worse service which then might make them more likely to re leave negative reviews and that problem can keep on going and going and going now feedback loops can be beneficial to a company for example the youtube recommendation system is notoriously a feedback loop um and that can be beneficial for YouTube itself because they're constantly having consolidating people into watching these like really big YouTubers who get more and more and more attention thanks to this feedback loop uh, and then bring more people into watching that YouTuber who then, you know, that motivates the recommendation system to then recommend that big YouTuber more and more and more, right? With when YouTube has celebrities like that, it's going to really benefit them because that you know that's a draw to the platform. That's a reason why people will come to the platform. People will be sharing, you know, this is what this big YouTuber did, and they're uh, they, they kind of become a face for the platform. If you think about people like Mr. Beast, like Logan Paul, all that kind of stuff. A lot of their fame has to do with them getting caught up in a feedback loop and that's beneficial for youtube so they may not try to break that necessarily it's in a lot of companies best interests to break a feedback loop however in order to get accurate results in order to accurately predict things or accurately build their systems and ethically speaking you do want to um you do want to break feedback loops as well because feedback loops can be really harmful for users. Really, really harmful for users. If we um, think about the AI recommendation system in the ethics discussion, if we imagine that this recommendation system is partially motivated by how many patients are continuing to stay on this drug without being switched off of it. If you have a drug that works like fine, then patients staying on it uh, would potentially then motivate the system to recommend the drug more, which means more patients stay on it and are fine, which means that the recommendation system continues to recommend that drug and so on and so on and so forth if a new better drug gets released that performs a lot better they might have to contend with the fact that well in the system's eyes a lot of people are staying on this drug and it seems to be working really well for them so that's where a recommendation system like that could cause harm or at least prevent people from being in the best place that they possibly could be a really interesting one is bias due to system drift, because systems might be updated as time goes on. Things might be changed in order to um, try to improve the system, but this can actually cause bias in the data. One really interesting example was there's this uh, thing called Google Flu, which was an attempt by Google to try to model how many patients there might be that come down with the flu. Uh, and they're doing this based on how many people were searching for flu symptoms. They're trying to make a model based on that sort of input data. They're trying to make a model to predict the future of, you know, well, this many people might get the flu in this year. Sort of a, regress a regression type analysis of Based on, you know, these searches, these searches, these searches, all that kind of stuff. What is our odds? Uh, or what is the number of people we're going to see with the flu? The problem is, is that they then started introducing changes to the recommendation algorithm that actually caused people to start searching for flu symptoms more. Maybe this had to do with the fact that their recommendation algorithm was like, well, you know, it's getting into flu season. Maybe people like we're, maybe people are going to be more likely to search this kind of stuff. So we're going to push these recommendations, and then people were more likely to actually click those recommendations when they were searching for stuff, and that would mean more people were searching for things about the flu, flu symptoms, 
uh, different strains of the flu, flu vaccines, all that kind of stuff. This then leading Google flu to overestimate how many people were going to possibly come down with the flu. And I believe the prediction was like two times over or something like that. It was a huge deal. So the system drift in this case was Google adding their recommendation system, making that more powerful. And the bias then was uh, more people were searching for flu symptoms than would have been without this system drift, without this addition of the um, without this addition of the recommendation system. The bias here is that, you know, the bias data lead led the model to think that more people were coming down with the flu. And then the model was updated so that its predictions were way too high. So that is system drift bias. Emitted variable bias is a um, bias in data that results from a variable that is really, really important that actually has an effect on the outcome that we're trying to predict in a model, but that variable being missing in our actual data. So we have no idea that it actually does have that outcome. We, we just have no idea that it even exists at all. And for this one, I want to talk about the image that I just put up. Uh, what this shows is a typical sort of World War II plane. And the red circles on here each represent places where that plane was, that type of plane was shot by a bullet. This is sort of a superimposed view of the bullet holes that a lot of different planes that had you know, managed to return back from flying missions in World War II where they're being shot at, right? A lot of those planes had been shot in those areas. Now, a lot of people higher up were thinking, you know, well, we need to put more armor on the planes, but we don't want to armor up the entire plane because then we'll be using a lot more fuel. The, the planes will be a lot more, a lot heavier. So we have to think about, you know, where we should start putting armor on the planes so that, so that they're not really being affected by bullets. And if we were to try to make some sort of model, maybe a machine learning system that, or like a, uh, you know, a, a model based on the data that we have here, the planes that came back and the, um, the actual bullet holes that they got, uh, you know, the location of the bullet holes that they got would be the data that we have. And if we were trying to build a model to sort of predict where we should put armor on these planes, um, then our model would probably predict a similar thing to what the actual, you know, higher ups were starting to think about at first, which is that you should put a, um, you should put more armor where we see these planes being shot. Now, as the story goes, someone, I believe as a mathematician pointed out, well, we only know that the planes happened to be shot at these places because these were the planes that returned. And what we can know from that is that planes who were shot in this area were fine. They were able to fly back, they were able to land, and we were able to recover them, right? Notably, if you look at the cockpit, there are no bullet holes there because no no planes that came back had bullet holes where the cockpit was. We can probably assume that if a plane was shot there, the pilot would die and the plane would not be able to fly back. So that might signal to us that something is wrong with our data. The missing variable that we could think of here is, you know, whether or not the plane managed to come back from this, that variable being really important. And if we see that all of these planes have actually returned, that variable shows us that we have a biased data set right there. If we were able to see the bullet holes of planes that didn't return, if and having the variable of like whether they returned or didn't return, then our model would do a much better job at saying, well, the planes that returned, those bullet holes are probably less important to try to prevent. The ones that didn't return, these ones are probably, um, we, you know, we probably should protect the areas that 
the planes that didn't return were shot. Now, of course, given that this is World War II, given the fact that they weren't able to return plane, really get planes that were shot down back very easily or see where they were shot, the assumption was made that, well, the places where the planes weren't shot are actually probably the places that we need to protect, and that did indeed lead to more planes not being shut down. So that is uh, a loose example of the omitted variable bias, the fact that we admitted the fact that the, these were the planes that came back um, actually would have led to a very incorrect model. And then societal bias. This one is a doozy because it reflects how societal prejudices can actually lead to biased data. There's a lot of different examples of this and what I actually did was I linked a whole bunch of books and other resources in the wrap-up for this week if you want to try to learn more about real life examples where this happened. And I'll try to go over a couple of them but they're, it's really interesting and also extremely scary. Um, one example, and this is a little, this is one of the like lighter examples, still pretty bad, but was that uh, it was discovered, actually it still is a thing really, where technologies like Siri and Alexa and Cortana, all of those virtual assistants have a really hard time understanding non-American accents. In particular, understanding non-like Californian accents. They have a hard time with languages that aren't English, and when it actually comes to English, Californian accents, or you know, ones that kind of sound similar enough to Californian accents, are the ones that these virtual assistants learn best. And what people figured out was that this is because all that speech recognition stuff, the natural language processing, all of that kind of stuff was trained on people who lived in California because these technologies were primarily developed on the West Coast of the United States. Um, I shouldn't say all on California. I believe Alexa probably would have been done in like Washington but west coast of the United States of America. And this is a problem because if you are someone with a very thick New York accent and Siri was trained on a west coast of the United States accent, Siri's gonna have a really hard time understanding you because as far as it knows, you're not speaking words, you're not speaking English. You're just making sounds, and because Siri can't understand those sounds, because Siri's never under like never encountered uh, words that were um, spoken not in a Californian accent, Siri just assumes, oh, this person isn't talking to me. That's not English. They're not speaking English, so I don't have to listen or respond. The technology has since gotten better, but it's still not in the best place. Um, even now, there's a lot of languages and accents, especially in the um, non-English speaking world, especially in the global south, where um, people have a hard time using these technologies because they're so inaccurate. Another example is how Amazon used to use AI to screen resumes because they're getting a lot of resumes and they were just trying to cut costs rather than having people actually look over those resumes. They figured, oh, we can use artificial intelligence to automate this process, screen out some of the ones that are less quality, and then we'll just be left with a stack of good ones that we can really look through, you know, looking for keywords, looking for you know, all that kind of stuff. What they did was they trained a machine learning system based on the resumes of a lot of the top people in the tech field um, over the past, I believe it was decade or so. The tech field, which is a field notably dominated by white men, um, where there's huge efforts to get more women involved, there's huge efforts to get more people of color involved because there's this extreme lack of diversity 
in the field. What people realized was that because this system was being trained on men, women's applications were being penalized, which automatically gave them you know, a much lower chance of being hired. They, you could give this system a man and a woman with the exact same resume except for the name, and the system would penalize the woman. So it was contributing to this um, bias within Amazon towards men, and also could have easily caused a feedback loop had this been used to uh, feed more data into that hiring system. So it was a huge deal. They had to like publicly apologize and scrap that system entirely, and that's all because they didn't pay attention to the bias within their um within the resumes they didn't think to i don't know get rid of the names or things like that so that can happen that kind of stuff can happen when you have a black box model where you're just feeding data in and trying to see what happens um that kind of stuff can happen and that can lead to a biased system if you're not really careful about uh, vetting your data. There is specifically a lot of racist AI systems out there. There's a lot of stuff like, say, um, algorithms that are trying to predict whether or not a certain prisoner is going to be a reoffender, um, taking in two profiles that were exactly the same except for one prisoner was white and one prisoner was black and assigning the black prisoner a 45% chance, higher chance of reoffending. Also that same system uh, incorrectly assigning a white prisoner a very low chance of reoffending when that same prisoner had committed further crimes afterwards. So racial bias showing up in algorithms like that. There are cases of um, algorithms that try to predict where crimes are happening, specifically targeting low-income neighborhoods, specifically because the data it was fed had an overabundance of arrests in those low-income neighborhoods. So then police would then spend more time in those low-income neighborhoods, thus creating a, feed a feedback loop there. And of course, when you look at the ties between uh, economic standing and race, you see where the racism com can come in in that particular algorithm. Um, you have the fact that Google labeled black people as gorillas in its photo app using uh, a labeling a uh, image tagging system where and my best guess as to how this happened is that most of the images of people it was trained on were white a lot of these um training sets are self-created by the engineers maybe some of them will be of the engineers themselves which if they are more likely to be white and male then a program like that is more likely to decide that a person is a white man. So there's a lot of different algorithms like that. I, I mentioned the resources that I'm going to post in the wrap up. They're very, very interesting, very illuminating because they'll get into things like how um, financial institutions will have algorithms that can have societal bias like this, how housing algorithms or algorithms used in some of the programs that are meant to help uh, homeless people in, say, LA or something like that, how those algorithms can actually be really hurtful if they're not designed right. There's a lot of problems in these systems, and a lot of them really stem from biased data specifically a societal bias, and then a lot of them tend to be augmented by feedback loops as well. 
there's also how people can use data maliciously to affect a model. This would be um, the ethical discussion in the chapter is this company is using their data to maliciously affect the model to promote their own medicine, whether or not it is a good medicine or a bad medicine. They are still, it's still malicious uh, introduction of data. There's also the um, infamous Microsoft Tay, which was a Twitter bot that was supposed to learn how people on the internet talk by being on Twitter, by reading people's tweets, especially specifically tweets that were directed at it, and uh, then try to communicate back with those people using similar language. And all of that devolving into uh, horrible people making the bots say horrible things by flooding it with, well, awful tweets. So there's also that malicious way in which you can use data to affect a model like that. So that's something you also might have to consider if you are sourcing data directly from users. So these are really important considerations that aren't really talked about, I think, enough in not just the ethics section, but the uh, chapter in its entirety. Whether we're talking about machine learning or whether we're talking about models that you make from data that you're using, you know, predictively or to gain information or something like that, no matter what type of bias we're talking about, biased data creates biased models, which then creates biased results. This can be very harmful, whether it's harmful for your company whether it's harmful for your users, it can cause real harm. And you need to be aware of this by being aware of the data that's coming in, how the data could be biased, and how you can try to fix it or prevent it or things like that. So as a business information systems uh, you know, as someone who's going to be working with business information systems, even if you're not necessarily sourcing, being actually sourcing the data yourself, even if you're not doing the actual collection, but rather you're getting it from a data warehouse or something like that, right? Um, even if you're not doing the processing yourself, but you're just relying on the results, you have to be aware that these are possibilities. If you can't check the data yourself, find someone who can check the data to make sure that it is good data to use, like find a data analyst or something like that. Make sure that those structures are in place in order to make sure that your data isn't biased, because otherwise bad things can happen, as we've seen in this video. Well, that's the, uh, that's the end of artificial intelligence, that's the end of data bias. Thank you all very much for watching. I hope this uh, addendum is helpful. I hope it's something that you can carry on with you as you continue to work with information systems.